Hello, Rabbi, Rabbi Smith. The first story has to do with what was very common in the olden days that they would the, the non-Jews would make a blood libel against the Jewish people. And so the story is that very interesting story about the Baal Shem Tov, that the Baal Shem Tov at some point was planning on traveling to Eretz Yisrael. And he did, he traveled towards there. I don't think he arrived there, but he tried. And when he arrived in Turkey, uh, he felt like he lost his divine inspiration. He, he felt that somehow Hashem was angry at him and uh, somehow he had lost this, uh, the regular spiritual feeling that he always had. And not only that, but it was right before Pesach and he realized it's not meant for him to go to Eretz Yisrael. And so he was stuck in, in Turkey with his daughter, Adol. And um, they didn't have anything for Pesach. They were, they were really penniless. Uh, uh, I'm not sure financially penniless, but definitely uh, with matzah, wine, meat, fish, they, they had nothing. They didn't have a morsel of food that was uh, uh, for Pesach. And uh, not only just to eat, to stay alive, but more importantly, they didn't have any of the uh, mitzvahs that one is obligated to have for Pesach, which is the, the matzah, of course, and the four cups of wine and, and, um, and the maror, the bitter herbs. And so uh, the Baal Shem Tov had no choice. He said, you know what? I'm gonna hang out in Shul. In the meantime, his daughter, she went to the, uh, the seaport and was hanging out there. In the meantime, the Baal Shem Tov was uh, basically learning, learning Toyota, studying in the shul, in the local synagogue. And uh, this is already uh, the day before Pesach. It's Pesach, Erev Pesach, it's called. And um, so she went, she went to the, sea, to, the, to the water and she figured, let me at least wash the Baal Shem Tov's clothing for, for, for Yantiv. We don't have food, we don't have a place to stay, but at least let me wash his clothing. So she went to the, uh, to the, uh, to the sea to wash his clothing. And, um, and she's crying because she knows there's nothing, they're not gonna have anything for Pesach. Um, and, uh, and sure enough, uh, a boat arrives and uh, that is some guy on the boat sees her crying. He says, what's wrong? So she says, you know, I'm here for Yantiv. I don't, we don't have anything. My, my father is, uh, 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 Hashem must be angry at us because we don't have anything and we're stuck here. And, and uh, you know, um, that's why I'm crying. So the, the man says, come, you'll be my guests. Go get you, go tell your husband, go tell your father to, uh, my address is this in the street, and you'll come, come to come and be my guest for, 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 for the Seder, for, for the few days of Yontiv, and so on. So sure enough, she goes, gets her father from the shul, and uh, they come to this man's house, this uh, merchant who got off the boat. And uh, sure enough, uh, that night, that afternoon, the Baal Shem Tov went to sleep. And when it came time to do the Seder, so the, uh, the merchant, he tells the, uh, the daughter of the Baal Shem Tov, he said, listen, uh, so we want to start the Seder. Go tell her, go wake your father up. She says, no, absolutely not. I, uh, I would never uh, wake him up. So the host was getting a little uh, impatient. So he said, let me go myself. And he goes and he sees the Baal Shem Tov's face aflame. And he realized this man must be a very holy man. And, uh, you know, he, he decided to, he started the Seder himself, his family, but they didn't, uh, they didn't wait for the Baal Shem Tov. And um, somewhere in the middle of the Seder, the Baal Shem Tov got up and um, uh, and, and uh, the Baal Shem Tov joined them. And um, 
the Baal Shem Tov said a pasuk, a verse out loud. He said, At the end of the Haggadah, there's a special, there's a special um, um, uh, a verse that says, praise him who alone does great wonders for his loving kindness endures forever. Um, so the Baal Shem Tov, he, you know, he woke up late. Uh, they were in the middle of the Seder. He had the Davin Mairev. He had to say the night services. And uh, it's quite late. Um, um, and uh, he, he, he said this verse very loud. You know, this, this verse about Hashem's wonders. Anyway, the merchant did not ask any questions. But a whole time. But when the Baal Shem Tov said this verse out loud, he said, you know what? Now it's a time to ask him what's going on. So he said, why, when you were sleeping, um, was your face aflame and you were, you were crying, looked like you were crying? And uh, why, during the Seder, did you, cr- did you scream out this verse? And so um, the Baal Shem Tov said, listen, there's a very serious decree that was threatening the lives of the Jews of Istanbul. And I made every endeavor to abolish this decree and annul it in the heavenly court. And um, I even offered my own life to give up my life to save the Jewish people here, the entire, the entire town. And thank God my, my request bore fruit. And at the very moment that I said that verse out loud, uh, it was it was uh, abolished. The decree was was removed. And uh, tomorrow morning in Shul, you'll hear what it what this is all about. So sure enough, the next morning in Shul, um, when they were ready to 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 start the davening, so there was a very prominent uh, businessman who arrived, a wine merchant, and. Uh, uh, he uh, uh, he screams out, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. Uh, we've been saved from a terrible decree and um, Hashem has saved us. So the question is, what exactly was the story? What, what was the decree and what exactly did the, uh, what the Baal Shem Tov do? So the story was that one of the sultans of Istanbul um, um, would like to take a stroll uh, in, incognito and, uh, uh, you know, he would disguise himself like a regular person, regular individual. And uh, people, you know, in this way, he would uh, stroll down the streets and no one would ask any, it would bother him. And, um, and uh, sure enough, one time he, he went a little too deep into the uh, into the uh, dangerous uh, neighborhoods, and uh, he was kidnapped. And of course, they emptied his pockets. Not only did they empty his pockets, but they told him that they are going to kill him because otherwise, you know, he'll they'll they'll they'll, they'll be after him. So. He realized that if he lets anyone, he lets these people know that he's the king, for sure they're going to kill him. And uh, he figured, let me just pretend that I know how to make, how to design beautiful, beautiful sheets. And he told him that I have a profession. He said, listen, if you want to kill me, you're not going to get too far. Because uh, what good will that do? But I, I can make these bed covers and um, you'll be able to sell them for a very high price. And you'll make a lot of money. And over the years, you know, you can, you, you, it'll be worthwhile, worth your while. Let me live. I'll, I'll benefit because I'll live and you'll benefit because you'll really get rich. And uh, they, 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 you know, they, they bought into his, uh, his uh, story. Uh, he said, listen. Let me, you know, buy me these bed covers and I'll design it nicely. I'll add nice uh, uh, designs onto it. 
and I'm a professional. And don't, don't let anyone tell you that it's worth any less. You have to sell it for a very high price. And Amen. this is the, the price that you need to sell. He gave them the number of how much would be a good price to sell these bed covers. And uh, sure enough, uh, he, he created the first one and he gave it to the, uh, to the uh, captors that they should go and try to sell it in the, uh, in the marketplace. And um, obviously they locked him up while they went on their travels and uh, they tried to sell it. And, uh, and of course, everyone was laughing at them when, he, when they said the price. But uh, sh sure enough, they came upon a very wealthy Jewish man, and uh, he realized something looked a little strange. He saw the bed cover, and it had the, the, the first letter of the Sultan's name on it, and that was the design. And they're asking a crazy amount of money for this, for this bed cover. So he said, there must be something behind this. Let me buy it even though it's a waste of money. And let me see. So sure enough, he paid the price uh, to buy it. And uh, sure enough, another, the next day or uh, some days later, the people came again, they had another one. And he looked at the second one, you know, they tried to sell it at the, the, in the regular uh, uh, um, area where people would, would sell their wares, no one, uh, people were laughing at, at these uh, captors to try to sell for such an exorbitant fee. So sure enough, they, um, sure enough, they, they, uh, they, they went back, they went to this man's store and they said, you know, we have a second one, another bed cover. And it turned out that the, the, man, the man looked at the next bed cover and it had the second initial, or the second letter of the Sultan's name on it. So the wealthy man again said, this seems like, uh, you know, it sounds like maybe there's something going on here. So he bought it from them and he quickly went to the palace to tell the palace that this is strange and he thought that maybe it's important for them to know that maybe, you know, uh, you know, maybe the, uh, th this is uh, uh, a, uh, um, something going on with the Sultan, maybe, uh, you know, and, and maybe this might uh, be connected if there's anything going on that the government, that the palace, that the uh, uh, government officials know, you know, they might want to know that this man is selling these for a very high price and it, it may be the, the, you know, maybe the Sultan is involved with this. Anyway, sure enough, they, of course, they were very excited to hear this because, you know, the Sultan had been missing for two days. And, um, and so they said, you know, let's see what happens the next day. If another one comes, another uh, um, um, uh, 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 bed cover arrives uh, and uh, if they want to sell it and it has the next letter. And sure enough, it did. So they quickly um, uh, arranged a plan of how to chase after these captors and uh, figure out where they're hiding the Sultan. And, um, and sure enough, they were able to free the Sultan from these captors. And uh, when, he, um, when he was finally freed, he uh, went to pay the Jewish man a, 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 a visit and, um, and he offered him whatever he would like. Uh, he's willing to give him as a gift for saving his life. And the Jewish man said, listen, I, I don't want any gift. I'm happy to be, I'm honored to be able to save the king's life, the Sultan's life. And uh, that itself is a good enough gift. And so the Sultan said, listen, I'm going to give you a uh, special um, honor that you and your kids will always have access 
to me, whenever you want, you don't need any permission. You can ask from me anything that you ever want. And sure enough, that's, uh, that was, uh, that's, how the, that's how that part of the story ends. And the king went back, the sultan went back to his palace. And this man was, you know, satisfied, you know, he made a big kiddush Hashem. And he honored Hashem, sanctified Hashem's name, showed that, you know, he, he uh, uh, did it, you know, cared for mankind. And, um, and uh, you know, and, and everything was good. Turned out he passed away and the Sultan passed away. And then, so the next generation, the, the, the son of this merchant uh, was given a, the son of the merchant was given a, um, had a dream, excuse me. The son of the merchant had a dream that his father was right before Pesach. His father came to him in a dream and the dream was that uh, hurry up and go to the palace because you need to take advantage of our, of our uh, promise, uh, the, the promise that was given to us from the, from, the, uh, from the Sultan. Excuse me one second. So uh, basically, so the Sultan, um, so, so this man has this dream that he should go to the Sultan and tell him that, uh, you know, we have a promise and, uh, um, and uh, you know, we understand that this, uh, I, uh, in, in the dream, his father had told him that, you know, they're, they're trying to make a, a libel against the Jewish, whole Jewish community, and they're going to be, uh, and uh, they're claiming that you people, uh, you know, uh, uh, kill uh, Muslim, Muslim uh, uh, children in order to have blood for your matzah and so on. And so the, um, uh, the, this, this uh, Jewish man, he had this dream that he should go and tell the king, the king that it's not true and, and uh, uh, you know, beg them to look into it and realize that it's not true. And not only that, but the, the person, the chief officer who made up this story to the king, uh, he himself is not even a Muslim. He's really a Christian and he wears a cross. And his, the, the proof is that he has a cross when he goes to sleep, he puts a cross on, his, on, uh, on him as a necklace, a necklace cross on him. So that's the, uh, that was the dream he had. Uh, of course, he pushed off the dream. And then it's Erev Pesach. This is, uh, wakes up Erev Pesach. He has this dream, he pushed it off. Then sure enough, during the day, he gets very tired. And he falls and goes to sleep or he light, lays down and he has another dream. His father again tells him, this is extremely urgent. You have to go to the palace and, uh, and speak to the Sultan. And... Um, and it's already late, you know, late uh, uh, Pesach, it's Pesach night, he had woken up, it's right by Pesach, the beginning of Pesach. And uh, he goes to, the, goes to the palace and um, he, uh, he speaks to the, uh, to the, to the guards, he explains to them who he, he, I don't know if he has a letter saying that he has permission to, uh, to, to go whenever he wants. Anyway, so he gets himself in to the, to the palace and uh, he, uh, he's nervous that the, the king maybe is uh, sleeping already, but the, the, the king's mother, the sultan's mother, excuse me, the sultan's mother was still alive. The father had passed away, the old sultan, but the mother was still alive and she maybe remembered the story and he thought that might be a good avenue that she should go and wake up her son. So he goes to the, he, so he speaks to the sultan's mother and reminds her, tells her, you know, I have I'm the person with permission because my father saved the life of your husband. And uh, she, and he tells her this story that he had this dream twice. There's something going on against the Jewish people. And I am, I need to, this is urgent that I, that we tell the Sultan and we clarify with the Sultan that it's, it's all nonsense. And they could even look into it and find out they'll take a look at whoever this, you know, this uh, person is bringing this claim against us is. So the Sultan's mother said, I'm not aware of any decree against the Jewish people, but I'll go and let me go and speak to the, and speak to my son. So she goes and wakes her son up and tells him uh, that uh, uh, she, 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 she says, 
uh, she's ner- she doesn't want to tell him about the, the Jewish the, the Jewish person that the Jewish man that's there. She instead she makes up a little story herself. She says, "I had a dream that you're going to uh, be that you that you that that there's going that there's going to be a libel against the Jewish community," and uh, and the 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 Sultan says. Uh, well, it's actually true that they, 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 you know, they they use our. We're going to be arresting the Jewish community, all the people in the Jewish community that bake the the shmura matzah, because we understand that shmura matzah is matzah that has the the blood from the from a Muslim in it. So sure enough, the the wife, uh, the the mother, excuse me, the mother of the uh, of the current sultan, she's he's, he she says to her son. She says that listen, the real story is this is this is the real story. This man saved your saved your father's life, and the, the Jewish people are very respected members of our community. And this person, this this chief officer who made up this story to you uh, in the dream, uh, the the father had appeared to her to his son, telling him that you can go and check out. This person in his that this chief chief officer go check go check out his house and see if he's sleeping with a cross and he's not even a real Muslim he's an imposter and so sure enough they sent emissaries to the house of this chief officer who had made up the story against the, the Jewish community and sure enough there was a plan that they would all be arrested in the middle of the night and uh, the next morning and uh, sure enough. Uh, they found that he was wearing a cross, and um, instead of them uh, uh, um, uh, murdering all the entire Jewish community, he him he they decided to murder that he should get the death penalty should be executed, and the Jewish people were saved from this whole decree. And when did this all happen? When did this whole story happen? Well, it all happened when the Baal Shem Tov, number one was sleeping on the day of Erev Pesach. It somehow caused their lying down that that he was cry, the Baal Shem Tov was crying and begging Hashem to save the Jewish community, and that's when somehow uh, this man the, the 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 heavens allowed the father to appear to his son in a dream that he should um, or, or second time in a dream that he should come and save the Jewish community, and um, and uh, when the when, when, when the Baal Shem Tov had screamed out, when he screamed out this verse that Hashem does these great miracles, that was when the, that, that, that verse uh, was exactly when they had uh, annulled the decree and they decided to kill, they, they, they proven that the chief, uh, the, 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 the chief officer of the king who made up this libel against the Jewish community uh, when they realized he was an imposter and they annulled the decree and um, and they ended up executing him. So that was the story of the of the community of in Turkey that was saved because of the Baal Shem Tov's prayers um, before Pesach, or on Pesach. So now, <clears throat> what do we learn from this story? Yes, Gloria. Sounds, sounds like sort of an updated version of the Purim story. <laughs> well, we, we have, as we say in the Haggadah, B'chal dar vadar, in every generation, aleinu they stand on us to destroy us. Baruch hu miyadam, and Hashem saves us. So it is a, we have numerous stories that are uh, repetitions of the Purim story. It's a, uh, it is a every is a constant uh, continuous uh, story that repeats itself numerous times. Yes, yes, Ben. I, I wanted to say that it's a familiar story. The blood liable almost happened every year when the when the Jews had Pesach. They always blamed them for killing the kids and using the blood and and so forth. Right, right. It's a story of World War Two. On a smaller scale. So uh, that's correct. It would happen uh, numerous times in Jewish communities. It was not a, a one-time uh, occurrence, right? So, 
Well, the the ultimate example of the extension of that story was World War II, uh, uh-huh. Hitler Hitler regime. Right. He just had a larger army and um, and and more sophisticated weapons. Right. And he didn't have to claim. He his claim was not that we murdered the Christian. He just he just uh, didn't like the Jews. He didn't claim that we murdered Christian kids. He, he but, no. He, he just wasn't wanted. There a similar he just wanted case? to murder all of us. What? Actually, some people did, and use that. Some people use that as his. Wasn't there a similar case? I, I can't in hear you. Friends, I think there was a similar case. In, in France, I think uh-huh. there was a similar case with a blood libel, a famous case that went to court. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. No, I, maybe you're talking about the Bayless, the Mendy, the Mendy, Mendy Bayless the, in Russia. <clears throat> there was a famous one in Russia. No, 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 no. One, no, one no of the, there was also one in France. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was all over. I'm just, there was a very famous uh, case that was in court for uh, very, very famous, there's books about it and uh, uh, called Mendy, the Mendy Bayless uh, trial. But yeah. um, anyway, so the message, that, what, what, what can we, what do we see from this story? Number one is we cannot imagine what, what, what is going on in the tzaddik's uh, um, uh, world, what they're seeing, what they're, what they're up to. And the the responsibilities that lay on their shoulders you know the the, the a, a tzaddik is, is someone who a tzaddik is someone who um is, is sort of a a lawyer for the jewish community that's really what what moshe rabbeinu was they're really like a, a top lawyer that has to fight on behalf of the jewish people and and, the, and that's what moshe rabbeinu was that's what he did he, he really would, would take our case against, uh, against all the enemies of the Jewish people, the, 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 um, all the accusing angels, and Moshe would have to fight against them and argue, his, argue the case for the Jewish people. And uh, he was our advocate. And the same thing as all the tzaddikim over the generations, that's really what their job was, to be an advocate for the Jewish people and, uh, and, and fight for us and um, feel the responsibility on their shoulders of every single yid, not just their own, not just their own people, not just their own community, not just their family, not just themselves, but they, they carried, you know, the, the responsibility of the entire Jewish people, even people they didn't have any relationship with, even uh, different people who had different customs than theirs. Uh, uh, they have a responsibility to help, to help them and save them. And here we have Baal Shem Tov putting his life on the line, just like Moshe Rabbeinu did, in order to save, in order to save a community um, from being destroyed and from uh, from the, the enemies of the Jewish people, uh, uh, from 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 them uh, hurting us and destroying us. So here you see the, uh, um, and you also see how the how the tzaddikim they they they're doing things that we can't really relate to, like uh, we're not familiar with the. The the um, you know how they're li- the, every little action that they do is uh, create is 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 ca- affecting something in the higher realms. Uh, it's a, is 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 a uh, so it's 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 not a, it's not just a small stuff. This is a very big big things they're accomplishing. So that's uh, I think a important message of this story. And. We, we take for granted that we live in safety, but we don't know how many times we actually had this, these miracles happen for us. These, we, we might on a personal level or on a communal level, we might have stories that we're just not aware of. Uh, and the tzaddikia maybe were praying for us and, and, and helping us and, uh, and saved us from terrible catastrophes or a personal level or, or a communal level. So that's the uh, that's the um, the blood libel story, and now comes the next story, is the story of the Rothschild family. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when the Baal Shem Tov said that verse, was he reacting to the to the decree being annulled, or was he annulling the decree? 
you know, I was thinking the same, I was thinking the same thing. I think the way it's, the story is, is, is told or written up is that he was um, reacting to it, thanking Hashem for, for helping, for making it annulled. Um, at least that's the way I understood it. I don't know, maybe, you know, but I, I was wondering the same thing, like maybe he's actually the one doing it. But. Okay, yeah, Ben. I think, I think that he was thanking Hashem that Hashem answered his request. Right, right. He, well, he asked for it and Hashem did it and he was thanking him. Well said, well said, yes. Okay, so now the next story is about the Rothschild family. The Rothschild family was a famous, uh, a very uh, prominent Jewish family who um, supported numerous uh, Jewish causes and helped the Jewish people in tremendous ways. Um, and they were bankers. And here is a story how possibly this was the beginning of the of the major success, maybe this led to the success of the of the Rothschilds. It was the 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 the, the father, the grandfather of the Rothschilds, the, the first one, I believe, his name his name was Remeyer Anshul Rothschild. And he was a shamus. He was like a um, a helper. Uh, an attendant by Reb Tzvi Hirsch of Chartkov. So he was a, a shamish by like a Hasidic, uh, Hasidic master, a, a great, great scholar. Um, Reb Tzvi Hirsch of Chartkov was the father of Reb Shmelka of Nicholsburg. So I, actually, I shouldn't say, I don't know if he was a Hasidic, Reb Tzvi Hirsch of Chartkov. I, I don't know if he was a Hasidic master or not. It could be his son was, Reb Shmelka of Nicholsburg was definitely considered a Hasidic uh, master. Reb Tzvi Hirsch of Chartkov, I, I'm not sure if he was just a great scholar or, uh, or a, I guess we could look it up on Google uh, if he was a Hasidic master or not. But in any event, this uh, Reb, uh, Reb Meir Amshul, Rothschild, he was a shamash, he was a helper, an attendant to this Reb Tzvi Hirsch. And um, it turned out that uh, uh, he, he graduated, so to speak, from that job and he got married and, and he, uh, he moved away. And um, the Reb Tzvi Hirsch of uh, Chartkov, he had saved up 500 golden uh, uh, coins for uh, dowry for his daughter. And uh, Erev Pesach, when he was cleaning for the chametz, he looked in the drawer that he normally kept it. And uh, he, he, uh, he couldn't find it, it wasn't there. The coins that he had saved up for dowry for his daughter for her, for, for her to get married it wasn't there this was a huge amount of money it was gonna you know really uh, uh pay for the you know really uh allow her to get married and uh this is uh he only opened it once a year this drawer it was he had saved up all this money and now it wasn't there and um now the members of the household, they initially, they, they started thinking, who could it have been? So they said, well, the mayor Amshel used to always uh, check the drawer before, you know, before the, uh, for the chametz. And um, now the mayor Amshel left and uh, they figured, uh-oh, maybe it was this Reb Meir Amshul who maybe borrowed it or took it. And um, uh, they, 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 they assumed it must have been him because he knew where everything was and he had access to it. I'm not sure if he actually did the B'dik HaSchametz there or, or uh, every year, but he, he was the one who had access to every, 
every uh, you know every inch of the house. And he uh, was a good chance. You know, now he left, and all of a sudden it's not here. When he was here, we, we always had the money, and now he left. You know, the money's not there. So the initial thought of the household was maybe, uh, maybe uh, you know, he he couldn't control himself. He took the money. So the the father of Tzvi Hirsch, he said, "No, God forbid, we should never uh, suspect another yid to do such a sin. It's not right. It's called it's called chayshed b'kshedim. You're suspecting a uh, a uh, a kosher person." And so Reb Tzvi Hirsch always quieted them down and said, "No, no, God forbid, don't don't suspect him." But they gave him no rest. They were pestering him constantly. And they said, why don't you just travel to um, to, to, to where Reb Meir Amshel moved to and uh, schmooze with him, get a feel. So finally, he said, you know what? Um, let me go there. So he went to visit this Rameir Amshel, Rothschild, and he told him the story. And he threw a few hints, like, I mean, you were the only one that was, uh, you know, that had access to all of these, uh, to all of our rooms, to every, every inch of our house. And, you know, so he threw some hints, like, you know, it's missing. And, you know, I mean, you, you were... Uh, you were our, our gabai, you were the, uh, the, the attendant here. And so Rameer Amshul, uh, 20 minutes. Rameer Amshul, he, um, he quickly said, yes, it was me. I took it. And at this moment, I only have 200 of uh, these gold coins. But don't worry, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll return the rest soon, and uh, don't worry, I'm gonna. I'm gonna get it back to you. So Reb Tzvi Hirsch was very happy that at least now he knows where who took the money, and um, he felt good because he said, you know what, it's good. At least my family did not do a sin of suspecting someone who was innocent. He's guilty. He took the money, so it wasn't really such a sin. We we did we suspected him a little, but uh, uh, it wasn't really a sin. I mean, he, he he's the one who did it. So it was he was relaxed. He was happy that, and uh, sure enough, uh, um, you know, over time he had returned the money. Anyway, um, th at the same time that this was going on, um, they had hired a person to help clean for Pesach. And now, when, you know, while she was, this woman was, uh, this non, this uh, maid was hired, this Gentile maid was hired to clean for Pesach. So she somehow uh, was able to figure out how to pick the lock of this drawer. And um, she was able to open it up. And she opened up the, uh, either she had a key that was similar to it. Somehow she was able to, 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 to open this drawer and she uh, saw the bulging wallet that was in it with these coins. And she was the one who really stole the money. And The, the the story the story goes that her her husband would go to the um, local um, bar and uh, he would take one of these gold coins and give it to the uh, to the to the to the bartender and say here give me a few drinks take this go you'll go to the marketplace and sell it it's a gold coin. And uh, when you get the change, uh, you know, you'll give me back the change uh, uh, tomorrow night and the next night. Sure enough, you know, this was the daily occurrence. He would come and give them these gold coins. 
And they started thinking something is a little strange about this poor man who could hardly ever afford, you know, to buy anything more than the cheapest vodka. All of a sudden, he's buying the most expensive drinks and aged wines. And, uh, and he's giving us these gold coins. They went to the, uh, to the police of their town and, and they, uh, they, they mentioned this story to him. He said, listen, you got to get this guy fully drunk. And when he's fully drunk, surround him with his friends, get him comfortable and uh, ask him what the story is with these coins. And sure enough, they got him very, very drunk one night. And uh, they, uh, they were able to get the information out of, the, uh, out of this um, husband, the husband of the maid, out of his, uh, to, for him to reveal the story. So, um, so in his drunkenness, he revealed to them how proud he was to, uh, to uh, be able to steal these, these gold coins from the rabbi's uh, drawer, how his wife was able to get it. And so sure enough, they, um, they, had, they brought him to the police and uh, he admit, you know, they, they testified this is what he said and he admitted it. And uh, sure enough, they called the, the rabbi to come uh, to, to come see the chief of police. So the, the, the Rav was always very nervous. Um, who knows what type of a uh, blood libel if something's going on. He's being, uh, uh, you know, he's being summoned by the chief of police. So he was very uh, concerned. I don't know. 15 minutes, I'll be done. He's very concerned. And uh, he goes to the chief of police. And sure enough, he was shocked to see that they had the exact wallet that all the purse, that all the coins were in. And uh, uh, he gave a sign of, you know, uh, what was inside and, and so on, what, what the coins looked like. And uh, sure enough, uh, they returned it to the, to the, to the Rav, Rav Tzvi Hirsch. Now, Rav Tzvi Hirsch was now shocked because now he realized that really the, 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 the full story is that the maid had stolen the money. And this Reb, uh, um, Reb, Reb Meir uh, um, Amshul uh, was, uh, was, uh, was really innocent. And uh, he had admitted that he, he admitted that he took the money. So the three Hirsch was like a little shocked. So he quickly set out to tra travel to Reb Meir Amshul. And he went to him. And he, and he, and he uh, apologized uh, completely how, how foolish he was for thinking that it might have been him and what a chutzpah uh, he had that even thought of that uh, anyone even thought of such a thing. And uh, he felt so bad. And he said, but why did you admit that it was you? So, so he said that, you know, he saw how concerned the Rav was, and um, he was nervous that if, if the Rav returned empty-handed to his household, um, it would really cause even worse stress than he was in already. And um, he figured that it's safer and healthier and, and it'll be a mitzvah if he just admits that he's the one who stole the money. And therefore, he, he claimed that he's, he was the one who stole the money. And he, um, he actually didn't have so much money to his name. So he gave him everything that he owned, he gave him all, all of his savings. And, uh, and he ultimately paid him the, the, the full amount. And, uh, and now the Rav came to pay him back, of course, and um, gave him back his money. And he begged him forgiveness for suspecting him. And, uh, and sure enough, that is 
the story behind the Rothschild's mitzvah of how they ended up becoming very wealthy, ultimately in the merit of this mitzvah of saving another Jew from returning to his family empty-handed and being able to marry off his daughter, that was the channel, at least the, the, that is one of the understandings that we, that we have, that that's what brought about the great gift that Hashem brought upon the Rothschild family, that they should be the uh, pillars of charity and generosity um, for, uh, for generations. So that's the, that's the story. Does anyone want to share any thoughts about this story? You know, I, I'm sorry, I think that to confess to a crime that he did not commit in itself was a sin. And I can understand him wanting to save another Jew, but um, he did tell a lie that, that this is, in a sense, not forgivable. Mm -hmm. So you don't think that Hashem is going to forgive him? Well, I think Hashem took care of him, and I, I don't have a problem with that. But I, I think that there's... I have a problem with somebody con confessing to a crime that he did not commit. Uh -huh. Even if it's going to save someone's life? There, there are other ways to save a, save a person's life. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. He, he, could have, he could have said, I didn't do it, <clears throat> but I realize this puts you in a problem so here let me give you these 200 of my own money uh-huh uh-huh okay. and then he would have been an honest man and uh -huh. he would have accomplished the same thing right i think gloria's idea is really good uh-huh 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 okay any other thoughts yes so uh, will yeah you're you're muted Oh, I, I clicked the wrong button. Um, we have the issue of the fellow receiving the money, knowing that he is taking charity himself. Uh, the best charity is, well, I guess if you don't know it, and if you don't know the donor either, but um, at least this way he would avoid feeling like he himself is a charity case. So you're answering Gloria's question. Uh, I'm, I'm rebutting it. Yeah, right. Huh. That, uh, that if he did it that way, yeah, it would sound good, except that he would know that there was some charity involved for him. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking that when he saw his former employer in such anguish, he couldn't handle it. And he said, you know, you know what? I took it and I'm going to pay you back. It was just too much for him to bear. And he just had such self-sacrifice that another person, another Jew, he would be able to, to nullify this rabbi's anguish by saying, yeah, I took it. He decided, you know what, it's a lie, but I'm going to do it because I'm going to save this person from such sorrows by me, it, by me admitting, even if it's not true, I'm going to save him from sorrows. And if I get in trouble for it, um, that's my self-sacrifice to help this other person, it's, and especially the rabbi, and it was a, just not another person, it was his employer, and, and it was the Rav. So it was like uh, he, made a, he made a cheshpan, he made an account, like uh, I, I might get in trouble from lying, but I'd rather save the rabbis from, from Soros. Mm -hmm. Okay, very nice. But stuff. why, why Just should one he second. save? Uh, let, let, me, let me let Ben, Ben, was, ben, ben has had his hand up. Ben? I wanted to say that he did the right thing was marrying off someone's daughter, helping marrying off someone's daughter is a big mitzvah. Uh -huh. And he figured for that mitzvah, he probably will get enough money to return to him the money that was stolen and help him marry off his daughter. And that was important to him more than saying, no, I didn't do it. And then they wouldn't know who did uh -huh. anyhow. So right. he right. wanted to do the mitzvah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, Gloria, you wanted to... Yeah. But he made a mistake. It wasn't another Jew anyway, as it 
turned out who stole the money. Plus, if somebody stole, why should he protect them? Why protect, why, even if it's another Jew, why save him when he was a thief? Ben, do you want to answer her? Ben, would you want to answer her? Yeah, I want to answer it because as long as they didn't catch anybody else, he was the suspect. So he would be a suspect, and in case they didn't find who did it, he would always stay a suspect. And he would lose the mitzvah, and he would, he would gain you know, a bad name. So he didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Miranda? Yeah, there's another reason maybe he lied because he thought the Rav wouldn't accept the money from him as Sadaka because he knew that um, he was poor at the time. So perhaps he thought that was the only way. I don't know. I don't think it's good to lie either. But perhaps he thought the Rav wouldn't accept the money from him. It's a possibility. Yeah, yes. I think that's a very good, very good thought. I think a lot of explanations. I think it's a good question Gloria is asking, but I think we have a lot of good explanations. Um, um, I would also say that, you know, we, we, we always wonder how exact the story is. What exact words did Mayor Amschel uh, use when he said that, uh, uh, yes, I did it. Did he say, did he say something like, yes, I did it? Or did he say more like, you know, once in a while, people are in a bad, are in a tough situation, but let me give you uh, the 200, you know, like, you know, like maybe he didn't actually say it exactly in those words. I took it. Maybe he just gave a, like a little implication, like it might've been him. Like, you know, sometimes people borrow something and they, they, you know, they forget to ask. Maybe he said something like that, you know, and then just said, and, and let me give you the 200, 200 of it and, and I'll get you, you know, so maybe he didn't actually lie, but he gave a little implication like it was him. And uh, of course the Rav thought he was, you know, it sounds but, like you're admitting it. You're just not saying it outright, you know? Yeah, that, but that's a whole different statement. That's not a confession for something he didn't do. That's simply saying, I, I don't know what happened, but let me help you out until we find out what did happen. That's a different issue. Well, that it, depends, it, it depends what he said. Your option is that he, you know, did he say I stole it or did he say I didn't steal it? But I'm giving something in the middle. It doesn't fall into either of those two categories. He gave a little implication, but he didn't say it clearly that he stole it. Like a lot of people, when they don't like to admit to doing something wrong, they'll leave it a little vague and they'll sort of like bring back something that they borrowed, but they won't exactly, you know, there, there are uh, scenarios where people do things like, you know, they, they're, not, they're not willing, they're not able to admit it. And, and you know, that's the way people are. They, they just don't, um, they just don't, uh, don't do things like that. You know, they, they, uh, it's hard to get people to be honest fully. And so sometimes people just speak vague and you, uh, you understand that to mean they actually stole it, but, um, but that's not exactly uh, what they're saying. They're just, you know, they're sort of just leaving it vague. So I'm just giving a third option. Again, it, it's not, you wouldn't call it on our, you know, that wouldn't be called a full-fledged confession, but it gives a little implication like they're saying that. So I'm just saying there might be, it might be, you know, a little more in, in those way, but there's also the other, you know, we have these other ways of looking at it, which might be, and then again, you have the, the, um, uh, the Galbert way of doing it, which would have been, we, we did not steal it, but we will be happy to give you uh, the money to help uh, pay. That's another option. And that's another five minute four minutes. Uh, we'll be happy to, um, to give you, you know, to that, that's a very nice option, uh, uh, Thomas and Glory. I, I like that option as well. Uh, it, you know, all of these uh, ideas are good. And of course, uh, Mr. Rothschild had his reasons, which we'll, I don't know if we'll ever get to know. Maybe when Mashiach comes, he'll, we'll be able to ask him, uh, if, you know, and we can ask Reb Tzvi Hirsch if he felt that was the right thing to do or uh, if it would have been better to do it the other way. Uh, of course, it's nice hindsight is, uh, is 2020 and we could 
uh, it'd be nice to find out what should have what, what should have been the way to do it. But it's a, it is an interesting story, and uh, I'm just going to conclude then with one last um, with one last story. And the last story is that Reb, Levi Yitzchok of Bredichev was in the middle of his uh, was in the middle of his seder at the end of his seder, and he was thinking of how wonderful his seder was, and uh, uh, you know he he thought all of the right concentrations from the Zohar and the Kabbalistic meanings behind everything. And he did everything. He had the great matzah, uh, you know, really uh, extra special matzah that was, you know, the first bake of the, of the, uh, uh, you know, of the, in the oven of the matzah oven, which is considered like a, a special matzah, maybe it was even baked on the day of before Pesach, the, the era of Pesach matzah is considered more special. And so, uh, Reb Levi Yitzchak was very excited about how um, about his his stater, and in the and he gets a quickly a a a he, heavenly vision that tells him, Reb Levi Yitzchak, your stater was nice, but the stater of Chaim the Porter was actually better than yours, and so. Reb Levi Yitzchak is a little shocked. Someone in his town had a better, more holy seder than his. So Reb Levi Yitzchak asked his chassidim who were sitting around the table, he said, uh, does anyone know who this Chaim Porter, Chaim the Porter, the Chaim the Porter, he was a, a moving company, moving guy. Uh, so does anyone know who Chaim the Porter is? So, uh, uh, so one of the Hasidim said, yeah, I actually know him. I don't know where he lives, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I know him vaguely. So they say, so he said, I want, I want to, uh, to I want uh, the, my Hasidim, I want you Hasidim to go bring him to me and call him and find out what he did special. So sure enough, they uh, searched around the city of Berdichev to find where this Chaim, the porter lived. And, uh, uh, and they, they found where he lived and they knocked on the door. The wife answered and uh, she said, oh, he's drunk. So they uh, quickly, uh, so they said, well, let, let, we're going to go and maybe we could get a few words out of him. So they, they went to, saw him sleeping. They decided they'll carry him to Reb Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev because on Yontiv, you're allowed to carry. In Shabbos, you can't carry in the streets. But on Yontiv, you're, Yontiv, you're allowed to carry. So they, they had a few Hasidim. Uh, they were able easily to just carry him. When his, and uh, they brought him to the Reb Levi Yitzchak of Radichev. So Reb Levi Yitzchak of Radichev sat him down and said, no, did you, uh, did you recite uh, the customs on Shabbos Haggadah, the Shabbos before Pesach? Did you say part of the Haggadah? He said, sure. Did you search for the Chametz? Uh, the night before Pesach, which actually this year, it's not one night before Pesach. It's, um, it's actually Thursday night. We search for chametz this year. Normally it's the night before Pesach. So he asked him, did you search for chametz? Search for the, you search your whole house? He said, yeah, of course I searched my house. He said, well, what about the Seder tonight? Did you conduct the Seder? How did... So he says, well, I have to be honest. Right before Pesach, uh, early, early uh, era of Pesach, early in the morning, uh, the day before Pesach, they told me that I'm not going to be able to have vodka a whole week. So I decided to drink up enough for the whole week. So he drank a huge amount of, of vodka and whatever he couldn't finish, he spilled out because it was, uh, was going to be Pesach. You're not allowed to own any chametz. And vodka is made out of grain. Uh, at least most of the vodkas are made out of grain. So he, he, he drank as much as he could in preparation for the seven, eight days of Pesach that he's not going to be able to have uh, any, uh, any vodka. And, uh, and he got rid of the rest. And uh, that's how he, uh, you know, and so sure enough, when it came to the Seder, he said, I was quite uh, tipsy, uh, a lot, more, actually much worse than tipsy. And uh, my wife uh, screamed at me till she woke me up. And, uh, and uh, all I was able to do, and you have to understand, what do I know about Pesach? I'm a ignoramus, but uh, all I, said, I, I, I decided to at least tell them the little that I know. Uh, 
And I said, listen, listen, family, uh, we were slaves in Egypt and uh, uh, Hashem took us out and made us free. And now we're in exile again. And uh, we prayed that Hashem takes us out and makes us free again. And uh, I ate the matzah, had the wine, and uh, ate the egg from the from the plate. I, that was it. And uh, and uh, I'm I, you know I've been drunk since before and after. And so the uh, the tzaddik Reb Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, he said, "You can take him home now." Now I see why his seder was much greater than well, than ours, because everything he did with such sincerity, he meant every single word that he said. He talked about the exodus from Egypt. He felt it. He he understood it. And as much as he knew, he said he did the he it was completely uh, as he thought. And so that's the story of Reb Levi Yitzchok's uh, seder and how. The, the 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 other seder could be considered the the seder of Chaim the porter was considered um, uh, greater than his seder because it was done with sincerity, and that's the end of the story. If anyone would like to uh, share their thought on this story, uh, you're welcome to. Any thoughts? Okay. Well, just before yeah. we leave, Rabbi, when do we start again? Oh, class. If today's the last day, right? No, it's For not it's the last days of stories. The Hasidic oh, okay. stories. All right. So yeah, no. we, can, we continue next week. Okay. <laughs> We're going to continue until Thursday. So, okay. Okay, Thursday great. will Thank be you. the last day. Um, Hashem, hopefully, about two weeks after Pesach, we'll start up again. We'll be sending out emails and so on approximately uh, two weeks after Pesach. Okay. Everyone, okay, have great. a wonderful evening. Great. We'll see Thank you tomorrow. Bye bye. Uh,